going to read to you some foundational verses of where we will find ourselves today, and then we'll see as the Spirit leads where we go. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, just going to touch on these briefly because as we get into the message, we'll come back and address some of these verses. If you, if you uh, once again, once you find 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the very next book is the book of Galatians. I'm going to read to you a number of verses from the first chapter of the book of Galatians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading at verse 7. Just a few verses, transition into the book, the book of Galatians. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in the infirmities, in, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Focus of this message is taken from this verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now turn with me to the very next book of Galatians. Once again, I'm going to read to you a number of verses from this book to kind of highlight and show in terms of where we are in the life of this man that we've come to know as the Apostle Paul. Let's start reading at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God to the, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our fa and Father, to whom be glory forever and, forever and ever. Amen. Notice what he says in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ, to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or another angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you that we have preached to you, than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I not persuade men or God? <coughs> or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For if you heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond my, many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. My father. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. 
Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they herein only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come in the name of your son. And we honor you today as our God. We honor you and we give you glory for who you are. And we thank you that you have led us to this place today. Father, once again, for the benefit of those that are assembled in this room, I yield myself to you. And I pray for a special anointing of the living God, the unction from on high, that I may minister this, your word, to your people. If I have been deemed worthy, Father, I pray that you would use me for your glory. Not that I may be praised, not that I may receive any type of accolades, but Father, rather that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word. We honor you, we give you glory, we pray in Jesus' name. In his name we pray, amen, to the glory of God. Number of verses that were read this morning bring a tremendous amount of information in terms of the life of this man, the Apostle Paul. Last week, I began this message by giving you a number of reasons why situations occur in our lives. And for the sake of those that were not here or those that may not have heard, I'm just gonna to touch on them very briefly. Uh, I'm not going to delve into them too, too uh, deeply once again because we have been there last week. And I want to get to the place where we are and we, where we will be today. But as you recall, last week I gave you a number of reasons why situations occur in our lives and all around us. Many times there are individuals who ask that proverbial question, why has this happened to me? I believe that we've all been there at some point in time. We've all experienced situations and circumstances that we want to understand the very reason why that circumstance is occurring in our lives. Let you understand and, and reveal to you that once again, there are simply natural laws in the universe that cause things to occur. Why? Because God has set them in order. Many things that will not occur. One of the things that I did not touch on last week is in the area of a universal not natural law is the mortality of humanity. That unless, listen, unless Jesus returns in our lifetime, every person in this room would experience an element of a natural law that deals where their with their personal existence. Every person in this place would at some point in time cease to exist in the natural. That's a natural law. Number of things, once again, that we've come to the realization, free will oftentimes allows situations to happen in our lives. We're given the opportunity to make decisions. And oftentimes, whether they be good or bad, they, the, our free will will impact what happens in our life. There's the area of disobedience. When, when God calls us to a specific task, and for whatever reason, we get out of his will, and we get into disobedience, oftentimes because it's based upon what we desire, what we think, what we feel as though is according to our desires and our situation, can lead us into disobedience. I've also understood that there are times in our lives where, where God allows situations to happen so that we can remember who is in control, to show us who is in control in our lives. Oftentimes, situations occur uh, in our existence. Why? Because maybe we've gotten out of the will of God, and, and, and certain times He allows situations to occur to bring us back into restoration. Aren't you grateful that we serve a restoring God? We serve a God of forgiveness. We serve a God of mercy. We serve a God of grace. So many times, as we as children of God, uh, we go through situations why, in order to bring us back 
into our communion, our fellowship with the living God. There are times when I'm convinced that God puts us to a test to see how we will respond, to see what is in us, to see how how we truly, do we really trust the things of God in in, in such a way that, that when situations occur, we'll continue to abide in the promises and the purposes of God. So oftentimes those things happen in our lives. But we also came to, came to this place where we recognize that, that, that there is an adversary who is opposed to the things of God and is out to thwart everything that God has ordained for you and for me. And, and Brother West, you said it very well, but oftentimes, even in, the air, in those areas, we simply, for many people, they don't recognize how it occurs, not realizing that there can be some manipulation behind the scenes not realizing how oftentimes these circumstances will endeavor to manipulate our lives to go and get us out of the will of God. It's a spiritual reality that happens all around us. I'm convinced that there are many in the body of Christ that are being misled and being deceived. Oftentimes because the word of God is manipulated in in such a way that, that will lead people astray. That is the generation in which we live. But you understand that that is also an indication of the fulfillment of prophetic scripture. That in that last generation, the word of God will become uh, to a certain degree and and in many ways diluted and changed and altered to to fulfill the purposes of those who are rendering the word of God. It's It's a spiritual reality in the word of God. So what we learn once again is through all these reasons why we've come to the realization of why God allows things to happen in our lives. And and from that point, let me see if if you are are there. Have you ever been in this place in your life where you had regrets or something happened or or, or you didn't understand why it was occurring? Have you ever been in a position where you inquired, God, why is this occurring in my life? Have you been there? Once again, I'm convinced that many times uh, we as the people of God experience these types of situations. And and once again, understanding that premise, I'm convinced that God allows those things to occur in order that we may seek him, that we may pursue after him, that we don't simply uh, accept the circumstances and and, and just not try to uh, understand exactly what it is that God that you desire in my life in these situations. So so he desires a deeper uh, relationship, a deeper revelation that he may give us of who he is. So oftentimes many of these things occur and we've come to the realization. But last week we came to this place and and I introduced to you uh, the life of this man named Saul. We went through the areas where where he began to, uh, his life began to be transformed for the purposes of God. And when we we touched on his, on the road, being on the road to Damascus, and now Jesus appeared to him and, and, and he saw that, Saul saw this bright light shining round about him. And he gets orders and direction from Jesus Christ himself. At that very moment in time, we get to this place where we understand, as he wrote in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. Through his own experiences, he was able to convey the idea that every Christian journey is in a race. You are in a race, a personal race to determine how you will succeed, if you will succeed to what degree you're willing to compete to win the race in which you have now been placed in your life as a follower of Christ. Once again, through all these verses, we come to this place where we, we see that, that, that we, and, and let, me, let, me, once again, let me ask you this question. In the race in which you have been given, have you ever experienced hardship, disappointment, Have you ever been frustrated because of something that has occurred or is occurring even while you are yet running this Christian journey? Have you been there? All along the way, once again, there's this affirmation in the Word of God that that, that even in our Christian journey, that there might be times when we have hardships, when we have problems, when we have issues, situations that impact our very relationship, the very race in which we are now in. We've been there. We know what that's like. But, but, but I want you to understand, as I read to you, uh, 
these verses from the book of Galatians. And there are a number of things that I could touch on, but, but I'm convinced that that in and of itself is another message in and of itself. But I want to focus on, on, on uh, this verse where it's, it's right here. The, 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 in verse, it's verse 23. Listen to these, this verse. Because I want you to remember that here was a man who was so inclined to follow his faith and his system of belief that he persecuted all any Jewish person that he could find that had now diverted their spiritual faith and belief from what they were taught to following the man named Jesus Christ. And so we come to this place and, and we read this, this in verse 23, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. How many would say that that is a very remarkable statement in and of itself? Here was a man who was trying to destroy this new change, the way, this new way of life and new religious system. And yet now, because of all that he had experienced, all that he was going through, now this very same man, he who formerly persecuted us, now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. That is a testimony of the presence of the living God. I've said to you numerous times, I've asked you countless times, how many of you know that you know that you know that you have been transformed for the glory and purpose of the living God? Every one of us who is in this Christian journey and in this race, when we allow the Spirit of God to enter our life, to take residence, to, to be supreme in our lives, that He brings about transformation as we yield to Him on this side of heaven. Once again, with that in mind, I am convinced that there is no person in this room that has to yield to addictions and bondages. You might say, well, that's easy for you to say, but I'm here to remind you and to tell you that we serve a powerful God. We serve a God who lives within you by His Spirit and by His presence. And that same God that lives within you can empower you to overcome any situation on this side of heaven. I wonder if I have a witness today. That is the God that we serve. So through that, in, through that situation, I want to take you briefly. I, I shared with you last week just a little bit of this, of how Paul had previously experienced a number of things that impacted his life and his situation. Now, remember what occurred when he himself saw the light. And I want you to see, let me, let me go back to Acts, the, uh, not the ninth chapter. And I want you to see exactly what happened. Because now, now notice if, if you go back to Acts chapter nine and you find this account of, of the apostle Paul. And notice what, what it says. I, I went back and I reread this. And notice, remember, remember, the Bible tells us what, what had occurred. For he now, he says, in verse uh, number seven, and men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, when his eye, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So here we see in his, his encounter with Jesus Christ, seeing this very bright light, we see and understand that, that, that Saul, in essence, was not able to see him. He could not see. And notice what occurred. For in that situation, now the Bible tells us that he was given instruction. That, that, that it says, now a certain disciple at, at Damascus named Ananias, uh, and, and notice what it says. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the straight street called, or the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Now, 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 I want you to understand that. For here was this Saul, that the Bible says that Jesus said to this man, Ananias, that Saul was praying. So, so notice what, 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 what occurred. The moment he hears, or he's praying, now, now this man, Ananias, has a vision. Notice what he says. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive sight. So here was Saul, now not able to see, praying for his vision to be restored. And in a vision, 
the Bible tells us that he sees a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. What does that tell you? What does that tell me? That tells me that even in the natural, when situations have occurred in our lives, that God in the spiritual can reveal himself to us in a supernatural way. Notice what he said. He was not able to see, but yet in a vision, which tells me that it was, was not external vision. Internally, he was able to see, and he has seen this man, a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him. So, so that once again tells me that the, the, the Lord himself gave Saul this vision of this man, and now he is confirming this very vision with the man in which Saul saw in this vision. So we know what happens. Ananias expresses his concern, his fear about this man named Saul, for he had heard of what he was doing. And in this situation, the Lord reveals to him the very purpose why Saul was now in this situation. Notice what it says in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him many things that he must suffer for my name's sake. Number of things that are there. First and foremost, he's a chosen vessel. The Lord chose him for a specific purpose. The Lord chose him to, that he would, he would bear witness of the, of the God of heaven, of Jesus Christ himself, to the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul, Saul's life was to make a difference in this world. So much so that even today we are referring and speaking of this man named Saul. How powerful a statement that is. But then he reminds him, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Mentioned last week that oftentimes that very word, verse is a contradiction to what many of us are hearing today. Many of you have been taught numerous things that in essence give us a semblance of false hope in according to the word of God. And I'm not saying that we don't serve a God of miracles. I'm not saying that we don't serve a supernatural God. But I'm saying to you that you and I must put it in context of how it was rendered in the word of God. You will see as we go forward how this will manifest itself along the way. But notice what happens. Because now in verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you notice that? No, 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 notice, notice what it says here. You, you see two elements. Here. He has sent me that you may receive your sight. That is the natural, the physical condition and be filled with the Holy Spirit, the supernatural, the very presence of the living God. And notice what happened. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. There you see an area that we must understand here here it was that now in the in, in this situation that you may receive your sight that is the natural i am convinced that the god that we serve desires to make a difference in our natural condition in the natural but i'm also here to remind you that the very important element that oftentimes we don't focus on why because we're waiting for the natural manifestations we're desiring to see miracles we're desiring to see all these signs and wonders but here on this side he said that you may receive your sight and be filled with the holy spirit oftentimes we focus on this side of heaven on the natural but i'm here to tell you we must not negate the area of the, the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. There you see once again an area in the Word of God where, where, where you can understand that we serve once again a supernatural God, a God of spiritual healing, a, a God of natural healing, a God of supernatural healing. That is the God that we serve. But, but notice, I want you to see what happens. Because throughout his life, you'll see some areas that were impacted dramatically by this very experience 
A number of things happened to him, but, but though he was blinded, though he was able to see, in, in reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God, there was a lasting impact that that circumstance had on his life. And I'm convinced, once again, that Paul's eyes were never going to be the same. Now, let me, let me digress just a little bit. And I'm not going to get into this too deeply because I'm, I'm going to present some of these areas later on in another message. But today, I've heard a number of, of ministers profess that this situation that we're going to touch on today has nothing to do with his eyes. And yet, through Scripture, I will show you areas that we can see that it, without a shadow of a doubt, impacted Paul's life for the rest of his life. Let me show you. Let me show you some accounts in the Word of God. In Acts chapter 23, the Bible says, then Paul, now, now remembering, he, now the, the Bible doesn't tell us exclusively or definitively why he transitioned from Saul to Paul, but we've known him in his ministry as the apostle Paul. It simply could be a, as simple as now identifying himself with another, another name so that others would not associate who he was with who he used to be as Saul. Wouldn't that be nice if that could happen to us? That if people would just simply uh, associate us with who we are now as children of God and not how they remember us to be. But here you have now have Paul. But notice what happens that as I give you this, this example in the word of God. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. That was the high priest. Then Paul said to him, listen to, what, listen to Paul's response. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and you do commandment to be, uh, commandment to be struck contrary to the law. So now, now Paul, uh, in this situation, he, he in essence uh, says these words to the high priest. And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Notice Paul's response. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it was written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of all your, of your people. Paul knew that he was not to speak evil of the high priest. Paul would have known that the high priest was Ananias in this situation. But in this circumstance, he hears the words, he hears the commandment, and he responds in this way, and he's questioned, do you revile the God's high priest? And Paul said these very profound words, I did not know that he was the high priest. Does that not shed light on the fact that one of the reasons why he may not have known is because he could not see who it was who spoke those words. His vision was impacted. Once again, you will hear many, uh, many, many words to the contrary to try to convince you that, that this is not the case, but there's a reason why. Because do you understand that those words today, they speak against the narrative of the day. Today, all we hear in many areas of ministry is that God will do this and God will do that. And you as a child of God, based upon your relationship with him, will have any of these things occur in your life. But oftentimes we see to the contrary in the word of God. So I'm just simply going to highlight those for you this morning. Because I, I want you to understand that one of the purposes of this message is that you and I can somehow gravitate from the desires of the natural satisfaction to, to yet yearning for those spiritual applications that God truly has for us. You'll see through his life exactly what I'm referring to. Now, in another account in the book of Acts chapter 28, verse 1. Now, when they had escaped, they found out that, the, uh, that they were on the island, island called Malta. And you've heard these words. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But notice what happened. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, 
a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Two things that we can either take from that. Either Paul in his effort to grab these sticks simply did not notice that there was a viper in the middle of those sticks, or Paul was not able to see the difference between a viper and a stick. Once again, I'm convinced that if you and I were to gather sticks and we happened to glance down at this bundle of sticks and saw anything that just remotely looked like a viper, I cannot imagine what some of your responses would be. Some of you probably can. Listen, I, I hear a lot, I hear a lot of response from the ladies. But ladies, let me, let me empower you. I'm here to remind you that if any man picked up a bundle of sticks and found a viper and saw it, they too might scream as loud as you. That is the reality of the truth. I wonder if any man would say, I've got a witness. Tony, thank you, Tony. Notice what happened in that situation. Once again, I'm simply trying to help you to understand how that we can find spiritual truth as we read the Word of God. Now, now in these situations, in these situations, we understand how many of his words, I, I believe, could be, have been impacted. Maybe Paul, looking at his situation now, once again, having a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, only to have never been left of the same in his condition. It's a reality in the Word of God. I can read to you a number of verses that are here. Maybe that has something to do with this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Using the, the natural application and transitioning it into the spiritual. Notice what he says. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as, as I have been fully known. Well, what if Paul in his situation was able to relate of looking into a mirror dimly? Not just because it's a matter of explaining, but, but maybe that was his condition. Maybe his vision uh, in, in that situation pro prohibited him from seeing things in, in a manner in which many others could. So he uses that illustration. In Galatians chapter 4, for I testify to you that, listen to what he says, if possible, you would have gouged I, out your eyes and given them to me. Why would Paul use that example if his eyes were, as many say, healed or in the natural, in an effective condition? Why would Paul, as he's speaking to others, say, listen, if you could have, you would have taken your own eyes and given them to me, inferring that everyone was aware of Paul's condition. Yet today, that's not what we hear. I can't help but wonder in terms of, of, of all these things. And, and you, you want me to tell you one of the reasons why the multitudes can be deceived today? Because the multitudes for many occasions don't know what the Word of God declares. And we simply accept and receive what everyone else says to us as spiritual truth. That's why we encourage you to delve into the Word of God. Study it for yourself. But, but once again, as I study these words from the, from the time of the, on the road to Damascus until the very end of his life, Paul had a problem with his vision. It's there in the Word of God. Now, a number of things, once again, uh, I, I, can, I can express to you, I can show you, I can convey to you a, a number of things uh, that, that happened. Now, now, Paul, remember, the Bible says that, that, that Jesus was going to show him many things that he must suffer for my name's sake. A number of things have happened to him in his life. I want to, I want to give you another example, and then I'm going to move on to uh, uh, for, for the scripture. But, but listen to this, because I want you to see what the Bible says about this man in the book of Acts chapter 14. Listen to these words. It says, but when the, apostle, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude. Now, let me give you some context. Here were these two men that healed a man who had an infirmity all of his life. And when the people saw that this man was healed, they wanted to come and worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. Now seeing that here they brought about this, or healing was manifested in their sight, in their presence, and now they wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. So now here, because of that, 
The Bible says they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. But notice what occurred. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So now here were the people wanting to worship them. But then look at what happened in verse 19 of Acts chapter 14. The Bible says, then, notice, then Jews from Antioch and I came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, notice, they, they, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, the, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, you see what occurred. Here were, the Bible says, then Jews from Antioch came. They saw what had occurred. They had heard of what had occurred. And they take Paul and they stone him, supposing him to be dead. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that this was the first man that was stoned? No. Would, would, would you believe that they would have a pretty good idea of when a stoning had fulfilled its purpose? Can, can, can you imagine the violence of that situation of adult men grabbing stones and just, just plummaging an individual with these stones until that person was dead? So here they were, supposing him to be dead, and they drag him out of the city. But something happened. Let me remind you of what Jesus said. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul had a purpose for his life. God was going to use him in such a dynamic way. And now here were these people, these men that did supposing him to be dead. They, they, they killed Paul. They dragged him out of the city and they left him there supposing him to be dead. But I'm here to remind you people of God that we serve a supernatural God. And this same God that called Paul is the same God that is able to restore life even to the dead. That is the God that we serve. Don't tell me I don't believe in a supernatural God. All I have to do is read it in the word of God and it defines to me who it is the God that we serve so notice what happens can you imagine now the disciples gathered around him this man more than likely being bleeding and blood just coming from his body why because he's now been pummeled with stones now him being dead and someone would say, well, how do you know? How can you say that he was dead? Because it says, it says that he rose up and went into the city. How do I know? Because that is the God that we serve. Notice what happens. In that moment, can you imagine how his disciples must have felt? Now believing, well, we thought he had a tremendous purpose. Oh, can, the way that he was hit with those stones and now he's lying dead. Can you imagine in their perception and in their study in that moment, how all of a sudden they saw movement and here was this man that was stoned to death. All of a sudden the Bible tells us he simply gets up, he rises up and he goes into the city. Can you just imagine how those men must have felt to witness that very situation? Notice what happens. Because I'm convinced that something happened here that maybe we have not looked into. Let me preface this by using this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3. I want you to focus on this, verse 8. Listen to these words. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. It's a very powerful statement in and of itself. Because when we read that verse, we must come to the understanding that we simply don't know, even though it seemed as though Paul could have been dead for a very short period of time, 
we really don't know how much time it was in the presence of God. Because when you understand this, we understand the, the, the time frame and continuum in which we live in, 24 hour days. Many of you know how many minutes are in 24 hours. Some of you might have the audacity to know how many seconds are in 24 hour days. I don't have time for that, Brother Wes, but maybe I'll do it later. Here's the reality. The time frame continuum is different with the God that we serve. It's affirmed in this verse. Notice, one day is as a thousand years. Can we even fathom what that means? We don't, we don't understand in the natural what that means, but we know that it's different. So now, now, this, is ta this takes us to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Our foundational verses for this message, a message entitled, Then. Notice what happens. If you have your Bibles, once again, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now I'm going to begin reading. Because notice what happens here. Paul writing these verses. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. Notice what he says. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So, so now Paul is using that reference that, that 14 years ago, this happened. But he also conveys the idea, but I really don't fully comprehend what occurred. He, he, says, he says, I know a man who 14 years ago, he says, whether in body, I do not know. I, I don't know if, I don't know if the, this man's body, no, notice his humility in this situation, not identifying himself in this, man, in this, in this context, not, not saying, I know a man and his name is Paul. He doesn't do that. He simply says, I know a man in Christ. And what, 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 as I read this, so many things come to me that I hadn't pondered. But, but notice how he identifies himself. He, he doesn't identify himself by boasting. He doesn't identify himself by all his, his accolades and all that he's done. He identifies himself as a man in Christ. Do you see that? Oh, I wonder how many of us can simply use that manner or that method to identify who we are. Oh, I'm not, oh, oh, listen, I do this. I do that. Have you ever heard me? Have you ever heard, watched me? Have you ever found some way to identify who I am? And yet here was this man that simply said, a man that I know in Christ. Oh, what a way for me to begin to modify my perspective. So what do you do? Well, I know a man in Christ who's been called for a purpose in God. What a profound way to look at that. But he says, I do not know if it was in the body. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was, if the, the body was in heaven or whether out of the body, I, I do not, I don't know. I don't know. But then he says these words, God knows. Hey, have you ever asked some questions in your life? Have you ever wondered, oh, what is this all about? Listen, I'm interested. I don't know. Is there anyone here who can admit and acknowledge that every now and then you simply don't know? There's so many times where there are individuals, oh, I want to profess that I know just about everything to know. And here was an end, admitting, I don't know. But notice what he says. He uses these words. And here's some encouragement for someone in this place. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't understand. Maybe you don't know why, but I'm here to tell you that God knows your situation. I wonder, come on somebody, can I get, an, uh, can I get a hearty amen for the glory of God? That God knows, God knows, He knows. When we don't understand, He knows. When we're caught by surprise, He knows. That's the God that we serve. But he goes on to say, 
Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but once again, God knows. He just simply reaffirms that element. How he was caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. But, but notice what he says. He, he said, this man, all I, I don't know if it was in the body. I don't know how it was or out of the body. All I know is this, that he was caught up into paradise. And he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Here was this man named Paul identifying someone that he knew that had been taken up into paradise. He says, of such a one, I will not boast. Listen, if he referred to someone else, how could Paul, or why would he desire to boast about someone else's experience? Notice what he said, for such a one, I will, he says, he was caught into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one, I will boast. Yet of myself, I will not boast, except in my infirmities. Acknowledging there was some man, a man that was taken into paradise. But, but now notice what he says. He says, yet of myself, I will not boast, except in my infirmities. I want you to get that. Because I want you to see exactly what he's saying. He says, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth. Notice what he says, of such a one I will boast. He goes on to say, uh, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So here was this man that, that expressing that he knew a man that was taken into paradise. I'm not gonna boast. I'm not gonna say anything that is unnecessary lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Now, if there was any way of seeing that now, he is identifying himself as the person that he knows, a man in Christ, as himself. Notice what he says. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Notice what he says. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So now he, once again, is identifying who this man is that he's referencing. But he says, though I be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, knowing that now he has received from those things that, that they were specifically from Jesus Christ himself. Notice what he says. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So now here in this situation, once again, I have heard of individuals say, well, this has absolutely nothing to do with Paul's eyes. But yet here it was where Paul says himself, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. Notice what he says. He says, but, but so that I would not be lifted up in pride, so that I would not think I'm more than who I am, so others would not think that I'm more than who I am. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Notice what he says. In this situation now, acknowledging that he had been given this thorn in the flesh, something that Satan himself could use to continue to beat on Paul, to continue to buffet him, this condition, this situation. But notice what he says. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it, might not that it might depart from me. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded. I didn't just pray. I pleaded, which tells me that he desperately desired that situation to be different. He pleaded. Notice what he says. And he said to me, this being the Lord, in his prayers, in his pleading, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice what he says. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, 
in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Did you get that? You see, as I read this word, and I see this word infirmities, it simply rang out to me. Because remember, he, what he says, he says, I, I will, he says, of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities, acknowledging that he had infirmities. You see, the word boast simply means to think well of, to approve, to be well pleased, to take pleasure. But the word infirmities means this, feebleness of mind, of body, a malady, a frailty, a disease, an infirmity, a sickness, a weakness. Paul is acknowledging in these words that he had this type of infirmity. It's in the word of God. But then he says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. But, but notice what he says. He's already said, listen, I have all these revelations. I've had all these experiences. I could boast on a number of things, but I don't want anyone to think that I'm more than of, what, of who I truly am. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to point to you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to boast in what is wrong with me. Why? Notice what he says. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Did you get that? In his infirmities, he acknowledges that in those situations, that through his infirmities, in spite of his condition, in spite of his situation, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, we don't hear too much about that today. We, 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 we simply don't. Listen, I have heard, I have heard ministers that make me cringe of what they tell the people, what they can have and what they can receive and what will happen. Yet it contradicts oftentimes in the word of God. And once again, I'm not saying that the God that we serve is not capable of doing these things because I know that he is. But when we hear it, that because you're a child of God, you deserve this. Listen, I'm here to tell you that there is nothing that we as humanity deserve. It is the grace and the mercy of God. It is the forgiveness of God that takes us to where we desire to be. Listen, I don't deserve the goodness of God. I don't deserve the blessings of God. I don't deserve anything, but yet through his grace and mercy, through his grace and mercy, we are who we are in Christ. I want you to see this because in this situation, the Bible tells us exactly what happens. All these moments in time, Paul's life. And I don't know if you've been there before, but I've been there. So many times I ask God, why? Not because I want him to change it, but I ask why so I can learn what he's trying to show me. What is he trying to teach me? I don't know about you, but over and over and again, life is filled with surprise. Expectations that you didn't have, but it happens. It occurs. He was this man who was so desperate in what he believed that yet he had a divine encounter with Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed himself to him and in the condition of where he left him, now this man was to suffer for the rest of his life. But, but I want you to understand because now in this situation, a number of things have occurred. A number of things have happened to him. This is just not the, the one identifiable moment in his life. No, no. The moment he was called, he was to suffer many things for the purposes of God. And I'm here to tell you, people of God, for those that convince you that being a Christian is about everything that you want and you can get and have and all these different things, I'm here to tell you that God contradicts the word of God. I'm not going to tell you that God will not provide, for we know that. How many know that the God 
we serve will provide. How many of you know that when there is a need, the God that we serve can feel that need? I believe in that God that we serve. But I'm here to remind you, people of God, that this Christian race is not always easy. There might be some times where you want to give up. There might be some times when all these things happen and you want to quit. But I'm here to remind you exactly what happened to this man. Because notice what he says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a comparison that is made. He asks this question, are they ministers of Christ? He says, I speak as a fool. I am more. He goes on to say a number of things that happened to him. In labors more abundant, stripes above measure, in pre prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Five times he was whipped by the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods, and once I was stoned. We know when that happened. He says, three times I was shipwrecked. We know of one. Two others that aren't even mentioned in the book of Acts. He says, a night and a day I have, I have been in the deep. A night and a day floating somewhere at sea in the ocean, somewhere floating in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things. Listen, and we read that and say, you mean there were other things? Yes, there were other things. But he says, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. All that he had gone through, and he's saying, what comes to me, my, my deep concern for the churches is what's important to me. He asked that question, who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to stumble? And listen to these words of what he says. And I do not burn with indignation. Did you hear those words? Describing all that he's gone through. Who is made to stumble? Here was this man called by Jesus to make a difference in the world. And he says, and I do not burn with indignation. You don't think I get mad? You don't think that life impacts me in such a way? Like, why do I go through all of this? You don't think it makes me upset? He asked that question. And I do not burn with indignation? Yes, it impacts me. Yes, it makes me mad. Those are his words. He asked that question, who is weak? Once again, to be diseased, to, 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 be, to be sick, to made weak, be made weak, to burn, to be ignited, to glow, to, to figuratively, to, to burn with anger, to be inflamed. Here was this man acknowledging that life made him angry. His situations made him burn with indignation. He goes on to say, if I may but must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows I'm not lying. He says, yes, I suffered. Yes, I'm weak. Yes, I was angry. But look at what he says in this verse. If I boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. He says, yes, I'm going to boast. I have a number of reasons why I could boast. But I'm not going to boast in those things, my achievements, my accomplishments, who everyone thinks I am. He says, no, 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 I'm going to boast. If, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in this area of my infirmities. But there's a reason why. Because in the middle of that situation, in the middle of that circumstance, he understood that he could experience the very presence and power of the God that he served. Over and over and over again, 
I have to remind myself of these things. Remember how he said, I pleaded with the Lord. I had this situation, this circumstance, excuse me, in my life. That's the Apostle Paul called to change the world, yet suffering like no other. And he burned with indignation. I don't know if you're here today or you've ever experienced that situation in your life where circumstances cause you to burn with indignation. But let me focus just a little bit on what, what, he, what, what led him to this place. Because he said these words that I need to touch on just a little bit. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. He says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Doesn't tell us who gave it to him. It simply says that, that Satan used it to buffet him. Listen to what this word means. This word buffet simply means to wrap with the fist. We would use this vernacular, vernacular to be punched, to be punched, to be hit. So Paul was acknowledging that this physical condition that was given to him as a thorn in the flesh, that Satan himself used that to wrap him with the fist, to punch him, to hit him. I don't know if there's anything in your life that you can relate to that. how Satan can use that situation to buffet you, whatever it may be. Well, whatever's happened in your life, that maybe there's shame or, or maybe something has occurred that you don't have any answers to. Maybe somewhere along the line, you have failed and fallen short of the glory of God. And Satan uses that situation to buffet you. Have you ever been there? How, how he will use that, whatever it may be, to continue to come against you and fight against you. Yeah, you think you're a woman of God? Let me show you your shortcomings. You think that you've been called of God? You think that you're so powerful in what you do? Let me show you where you're falling short. You think God can use you because you're not who you used to be? Do you think, well, let me show you once again how you are not measuring up and over and over and over again, the enemy, Satan, will try to use that situation, that weakness, that failure to convince you that you not, are not who you think that you are in Christ. I don't know if you've been there before. I don't know if you experienced that before. But over and over and over again in my life, I have experienced this very situation. Areas of my life where the enemy will try to use and then try to discourage me in my life based upon what he is aware of in my life. Once again, maybe that's not you. Maybe you've lived that life that is just perfect and you've made no mistakes and you've never fallen short. Listen, but I cannot say that about me. I cannot say that that's who I am. I cannot say that that is me today. But I'm here to tell you that that same God that has called you is the same God that will give you strength in those moments of weakness, in those moments of time where you're allowing that situation to overwhelm you and overcome you. Notice what he says. In this situation, the Bible tells us exactly what happened. Because now, 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 I prayed, Lord, I don't want it. Lord, change it. Three times I pleaded, God, why will this not leave? Why am I here again? And now here in this situation is his response. I want you to see what happens. And this is what I want you to understand. Because I'm convinced that every now and then in life, things do not change. Things may not get better. And so what do you do? How do you respond? How you do you deal with that situation in your life? Notice what he says. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength. No, notice what he says. For the, this is the Lord speaking to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice what he says. My strength. My strength. 
over and over and over again in life, oftentimes we try to make it by my strength, our strength. And yet now the Lord is saying to him, no, Paul, my grace is enough for you. What you don't deserve is enough. Yes, I know you want change. I know that you want all these things to be normal. But Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, Paul, is made perfect, is made complete in weakness. Oh, convinces me of the idea that every now and then, once again, that is how God will often display himself in our moments of our shortcomings and our weaknesses. We see it in the word of God. So now Paul understands this, understands this. So he says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you get that? I'm going to boast in my shortcomings and my infirmities. Why? Because I know that it's through my disappointment. I know it's through my hurt. I know that it's through my frustration. That if I rely on God, if I rely on the presence of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what infirmity I, I might, might have. It doesn't matter what the enemy tries to use against me to beat me down. That if I just continue to trust in the God that I serve, that his strength, his power is made complete in my weakness. In other words, when I am weak, that is when he shall make himself strong in me. Now here are his words. So then he says the, this. Therefore... I take pleasure in my infirmities. What, what, what does that mean? With, to vaunt, notice, to boast, to glory, to joy, to rejoice. No, no, no. Most of us, most of us in the natural, we want to conceal. We want to hide. We want to say there's another reason why all these things have happened to me. And now in this situation, he says, I take pleasure in my infirmities. I'm going to boast about, yes, maybe, you, maybe I don't measure up to you. Maybe because I'm sick and in this condition, you don't think that God can use me. Maybe you look at my life and my past and you say, look at who you were and look at what you did. God will never use you. And here in the moment in time, we can understand that it's in those moments in our life that we can understand now that God has yet delivered you and through your situation and trusting in him now the power and glory of God will manifest itself through through the very things that you and I can find shame in God can yet display himself through and in spite of those things he says I take pleasure I take pleasure oh, oh. notice what he says in that situation over and over and over again, the Paul, he, he reminds us of his condition. But today, today, for many of us, we don't really understand fully how desperately we need his presence. I need his presence. I need to know he's with me. I need to know that I haven't blown it somewhere along the way. I need to know that the calling that he has on my life is yet here. I don't know about you, I'm just talking right now. I'm just, I'm just pulling back the veil. I'm just showing you my humanity. I'm just showing you that I'm not above you. I'm just showing you that I'm no different than you. And just like you, I have to rely on the promises and the word of God. Here in this manner, in this situation, he reminds us of who he is and what he wants to be in our lives, how he can be. He says these words, he says these words in that moment in time. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That, that, listen, that goes against our normal thinking. That's not what we're taught today. Brother Larry, that's not what we're taught today. Here, here is this man. I take pleasure in infirmities. I take pleasure, once again, no, no, to think good of, to be able to see the good in the bad. Here he was now in that situation. He says, I take pleasure in infirmities, once again, disease, infirmity, sickness, weakness. He says, I, he said, notice, in reproaches, re, in reproaches, notice, in injury, in insult, in a harm, in hurt, in a reproach. You know what happens today when, when most of us, if there's a reproach in our lives, you know what happens? We, we don't take pleasure in it. You know what happens? What, what, notice what he says, a reproach, an insult. 
Oh, oh, how would you respond when, if, if, if you were to be reproached, if you were to be insulted because you're a child of God? He says, I take pleasure in my reproaches. Oh, today, no, no, what, what, what did you say? That's where we are today. Oh, I, I, did, did I hear you right? Notice what he says. He takes pleasure in needs. No, 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 necessity. I, 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 don't know, I, I don't know if this is re relating to you in any way. I don't know if there's anyone here that has needs and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where it's going to come from and you don't know what you're going to do. But yet here he says, I take pleasure. I take pleasure in these situations, in persecutions, ill treatment, hostility, especially on the basis of belief, persecution. He says, I take pleasure in distresses, in, in anguish, in calamity. Once again, that, 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 that goes against our natural way of thinking. Because I don't know if there's anyone in this room where they say, oh, I, I hope something bad happens to me today so I can take pleasure in that situation. But yet here it is in the word of God. Paul acknowledging his spiritual truth. He says, in these situations, I, listen, I understand that yes, it's not good. I, I've suffered like no one else. And yes, sometimes I get mad and sometimes I get angry. Why? Because there's nothing that I can do about it. But yet in that situation, the Bible tells us exactly how all this comes together. Because notice what he says. He says, in that situation, I find myself in weakness. I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone today that this means anything to I don't know if even now maybe you find yourself in a situation that you don't understand and you don't know what to do. Maybe you find yourself in an area of weakness today, whatever it is. And only you know what it is. But here is this man that makes this profound statement that I pray will grab a hold of you in your moments of questions, in your moments of concern, in your moment of weakness. Because then he says these words after he says all these things, I take pleasure in all these things. I accept them. I, I deal with them. I acknowledge that they are there. I even try to find the good in the bad. Uh, I don't understand it all the time. I don't, I don't know why I'm going through this, but I, I'm going to accept the fact that that's what it is, and I'm going to accept it. Why? Well, why does he do that? Because notice what he says. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Did you see that? No, 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 notice he didn't say, for when I am strong, then I am strong. He says, when I'm weak, when I don't understand, when I'm in the middle of disappointment and hurt, when no one knows how I feel, if I feel like a failure, it's in those moments, then I am strong. Why? Why? Why then? Because once again, I'm convinced that it's in those moments in life that the God that we serve is able to convey to us who he is in our lives. Those are shouting words for somebody. That when everything seems to be going against you, you can just trust, yet trust and believe on the presence and promises of the God that you serve. Am I speaking to the right crowd today? No, notice what happens. Notice what happens. Because I want you to see this. I want you to get this dynamic here that's here. He says, when will it occur? When does it occur? For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
You see, so many times we're trying to solve it on our own. We're trying to figure it all out. We're trying to think, I got this. I can do this. But every now and then, Sister Loretta, we have to acknowledge that I don't have the answers. I don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Because it's in those moments of weakness that you're no longer dependent upon you. But you're trusting in the very presence, in the very promises, in the very existence of the God that you have come to love. That's the God we're talking about, Valerie. Not when we think everything should be our way. Not when we try to manipulate life to make it what we think it should be. But when we trust God through those moments of weakness in our lives. And you don't know what to do. But when you do this, then we understand the promises of God. Because it's in those weaknesses, in those times, that we can begin to relay and rely on the promises and power of the God that we serve. It's in those times. In those moments when we, once again, Brother West, we don't understand what to do. When we've been praying for a situation to change and it hasn't changed. Once again, I'm convinced, I'm convinced through the word of God that this is the very reason why Paul experienced many of the things that he went through. Once again, I, I'm going to tell you that it speaks against the narrative of the day. We live in a day today where everything is contrary to the truth oftentimes in the word of God. Today, the individuals, supposed prophets, profiting, uh, profiting certain things or, or, or naming and claiming certain things that, that, that don't truly exist in the word of God. Why? But why? You know, well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you one of the main reasons why. Because there are willing people willing to listen to those words. And they don't know the truth of the word of God enough to know what truly is in accordance with his word. And because of that, we accept whatever we accept. But I'm here to tell you, people of God, that every now and then in life, we must get to this place where we recognize that the grace of God is sufficient and is enough. Come on now, once again, am I speaking to the right crowd? Am I speaking to someone who's gone through some things and you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know what to do and every now and then you don't have any answers and you don't know where to go and you don't know what's going to happen and every now and then you say, oh Lord, change. Lord, I pleaded, I'm pleading over and over, I'm pleading with you, but nothing happens and in those moments in time, he says, listen to you, to whoever it is, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. What you don't deserve is enough for you. But understand, because it's in the moment of weakness in your life that I can display myself strong through those things. And yet the enemy, might, Satan might try to use those same things to buffet you, to beat you, to convince you you're not who you are as a child of God. But I'm here to remind you, people of God, in Christ, you are a child of God. In Christ, we can say, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. Listen, I'm going to boast in the very fact that I am dependent upon you. I don't know about you, people of God, but I will acknowledge, I will acknowledge that I am dependent on the spirit and presence of the living God. I don't know if that's you. I don't know if you can say that, but I have no shame in saying, I don't know what I would do without Jesus in my life. I don't know what would happen without Jesus in my life. And I'm here to tell you, in those moments of weakness, trust him. Depend upon him. Know that he'll see you through. Know that he can use that situation in your life to benefit you as a child of God. Don't expect him. Listen, if you're reading the books that everyone has to offer, live your best life now, whatever they may be, tell you, they'll, they'll write their books and say, this book will change your life. You will never be the same. Others, same thing. Oh, I went to heaven and I, let me tell you what I saw. Yet Paul went to heaven and he said, I can't tell you a word. Listen, I don't, you can believe whatever you desire to believe, but listen, I know of a book that if you take the time to open the page and get beyond the index or the concordance, you will find some situations in there that you will never, ever be the same. Now, 
I'm not going to tell you that life is going to be everything that you want it to be. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to have all your promises. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to have everything that you want. I'm not going to tell you that you will not walk around with this condition in your life. But what I will tell you, what I've learned, is that the grace of Jesus Christ, what I don't deserve, what I don't deserve, what I shouldn't even claim, what I don't deserve is enough to see me through. Why? Because of his strength in my life. Come on, somebody. Is there anyone else that needs the strength of Jesus Christ in your life? You don't have any answers, but you have the presence of the living God.